So, good morning. I find a lot of my stories come from childhood, but as we're talking about family matters, that's where some of the source is. My mind goes back to being a kid, and I remember, and this was a long time ago, there was this thing, it was called the Sunday paper. It used to get delivered to the house. It was a collection of pages with news on them that would come to the door. Somebody would bring it if you don't know what a newspaper is. So it differentiated. The Sunday paper was something different than the other six days a week. The other six days, it was just some thin rag that had some, some stories about woe and, and terror. But Sunday was different. It was thick and meaty. And if you were a paper boy or girl, you earned your living that day because this thing was heavy and when it flew through the air and landed at the doorstep it made a solid thud it was a solid thing but kids would run out there and get it but it wasn't for the news because who wants to read that junk I mean that's just depressing but there were inserts there were advertisements for stores there were there were coupons do we have coupon people in here I mean, there's one two three <laughs> Oh my gosh, I get the, you know what, the other day I bought a jug of laundry soap, had the coupon right on it. All I had to do when I got to the register is pull that thing up. It's at home, stuck to the jug. <laughs> there goes money wasted. But as a kid, the thing you wanted was, what was it? The comics, the funnies, it was the stuff, man. You race in there, you pull it apart. If you've got siblings, you're the first one to get it, and they get the leftovers. That was the stuff. And we had our favorites. You know, there were Garfield, and there was a few others. BC, always love. But there was this one. It was the family circle. It was just a simple little thing, a circle with some caption in it, and it was depicting life in a family, from a kid's perspective. It was, it was something amazing. The comedy would stem from misunderstandings about words or situations, things that were said. You know, sometimes the parents, they'd say, when you grow up, you're gonna thank me for whatever. And then in the, in the imagination of the kid, they see themselves in their adult phase and, and they're imagining themselves returning home to say, well, thank you for making me do such and such. But that was something that I looked forward to. You know what? God has emphasized the family. We've been looking at that for the last few weeks. That comic kind of put, a, put an emphasis on it, and God does his thing. We're finishing a series today called Family Matters. And this one I'm entitling Family Circus. You know, we all have our, our family of origin, and some were good, and praise God, and some weren't so good, and oh my. But God has made the family the center of society. Family is huge to God. It's important to God. Everything has been done in the context of family, and the story of Scripture is played out book after book about families. Like I said, God called a man and a family to start a nation that would bring forth more families, that eventually would bring forth the Messiah. He would be born into a family. Families are the pinnacle of society. And when family breaks down, society breaks down. And as we look in the newspaper and we see the things that aren't right, you can bet that somewhere in there it's a family dynamic that is not right. It's not ordered the way God had intended. Something a miss. We talked about in these past few weeks how Jesus has gone to great lengths to include us into God's family. Jesus was born into a family, but he lived his life and died in such a way so that we could find entrance into God's family. So we have a natural family and we have the potential opportunity to have spiritual family. But there's only one way into that spiritual family. You have to be adopted born into it, born again into it, and then you're adopted into God's family, and you become one of his own. It's a crucial point. 
Everybody is a creature of God. We're all his creation. We're made, but we're not all family until we cross that crucial line, until the, it's official that we're adopted and we're in. We've looked at the, the special importance of spiritual family. There's a difference. You see, natural family, sometimes we don't want to gather for, for holidays with because of some things in the past. There's stuff that happened, but spiritual family is different. And the length of time that we're with spiritual family is so much longer. It's eternity. We're with spiritual family forever. And now, if your natural family is also your spiritual family, well, that's the best. That's the way it should be. And that's what we shoot and strive for. And we learn in God's family what his values are, the family values, the things that are his focus. Our natural families, God has been wanting to win to him and bring into his family to be centered in him. These are the things that we've been talking about. But sometimes as we look at our family of origin, we look at the situation, and for many of us, and I'm looking at faces, and I know some of your stories, and I know it wasn't good. Some of you I know had a great growing up, and I'm glad for that. But there's many of us that are listening today that have situations that weren't good when we grew up. And as I'm saying this, you're picturing things in your mind. You're replaying the real, and you can see what it was. Family of origin has bewildered us, and we wonder, God, did you miss something? If family is so important, God, why did you place me in that family? Especially if you knew that I was going to be a follower, if I was going to follow you and be called by faith into this spiritual family, why did you put me in that context back then? It was rough. There was pain. I've got scars. God, what were you thinking? Some of us would wonder where God was in that mess that we called childhood or our growing up years or even, even our early adult years starting our own family. For many of us, the, the negative issues of the past still plague us in the present, and they affect our perception of self, our estimate of self, and our perception of the present. And we're not sure how things really are or should be. It's confusing. But I want to take you into a story in the Old Testament, in Genesis, and look at family, a family that had issues, too. See, this is the amazing thing about the Bible. It is replete with stories of family dysfunction. We can relate. It becomes real. And see, this is the thing. Even though it depicts the real-life family dysfunction in Scripture of the people that we would call heroes or the main figures or the, or the prime characters in these stories, it's real people that had real lives. It's not made up stories. And the amazing thing about this is that the depiction of the dysfunction in the lines of Israel, in the line of Christ, it all testifies to the validity of Scripture. Who would make up a story and put that junk in there? I mean, seriously, if you're trying to make a fake religion and you're putting it together, you don't think, oh, let me make the people look bad. You know, no, you paint the picture great. Just like when somebody asks you how your day was or your week. Oh, great, liar. <laughs> so if you're, if you're creating a story, you paint it rosy. You make it look good. But the fact that the scripture includes this stuff, this junk, testifies to its truthfulness. Because nobody would do that. It's authentic. Let's look in Genesis 37, 1 through 11. So Jacob, this is a prime character in the Old Testament. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. And then it immediately jumps to another name, Joseph. He's one of Jacob's sons, one of his many sons. Joseph a young man of 17 was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. It was a tattletale. They weren't doing something right. 
Now, Israel, who's Israel? Oh, that's another name for Jacob. Somewhere along the line, as he encountered God, God changed his name. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate, ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, whose fault was this? Was it Joseph's? I mean, for him, he might say, well, what's not to love, right? <laughs> but it wasn't his fault. Parents do pick favorites sometimes, and sometimes the kids know who's the favorite. Now, our girls have a running dispute of who's the favorite. The problem is, is I told them each separately that they're my favorite. <laughs> it works. You use what you got. But not in this case. In this case, it was actually true that Joseph was the favorite. And it was no, nothing hidden. Dad made it known, and everybody hated the younger brother for that. It was not a good situation. It wasn't Joseph's fault. It shouldn't have been done. We shouldn't pick favorites. We belittle the other siblings when we do that. If you feel like your other siblings were the favorite, sorry. God thought you were pretty cool, though, and he died for you. Joseph had a dream, verse 5. And when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, this is a bad situation. The holidays are looking rough already. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Should he have brought it up? I mean... Was he needling them? I don't know. I, I think in this instance, the young man lacked wisdom. And sometimes God gives gifts to people, but they don't have the maturity level to handle the gifting. But the gifting is there just the same. And sometimes we put ourselves in situations that we shouldn't because we lack the wisdom of God in that instance. I don't know, but mostly Joseph is one of these people in Scripture who starts well, finishes well, and he's a model, a type of Christ depicted in, in the story. It's a good situation of, of deliverance. It's a great story. But then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. This story, Joseph's story, is huge, big major theme. It takes up multiple chapters in the book of Genesis. Multiple chapters. It's a, it's a crucial story. And it goes so long, there's no way on a Sunday morning I could tell you the whole story. Hopefully, it's somewhat familiar, but if it's not, you should go and read this story. But Joseph's family was an absolute mess. Beyond what I've just re read from the scripture here today, his family was a mixed family. Now, we've had mixed families. So I have a mixed family. Some of you have that situation. But it creates some natural uh, tendencies to be at each other's throat. He, his brothers hated him. There were four women involved with his father. Four wives. Two were wives, two were concubines. All these brothers came from these four women. It was not the ideal. It seems to be that the ideal situation is one man and one woman married. Outside of that, there is issues. There's issues anyway, but oh my gosh, you multiply them when you have more than one spouse. It doesn't seem to be practical. Everywhere in Scripture when we see polygamy, 
It's not a good situation. It always has strife. It always has problems. It's, it's troubling. And that's why societies have made these decisions to say, you know what, probably good to just have one man, one woman. But then we're trailing away from that, aren't we? Hmm. Let's see what plays out, good or bad. The fruit on the tree will really depict that. His family was mixed. His father played favorites. His uncle Laban tricked his father Jacob into marrying a woman he didn't intend to marry, and that being Leah, and then manipulated him with wages and other such things. It was a messed up situation. And Jacob himself was estranged from his own family, his parents, and his brother Esau. Esau wanted to kill him. So this thing is just moving down through the family line. There are tendencies for things to go from one generation to the next. It's just a transference that happens. Our natural families can be so screwed up. But God, God can intervene and bring positive change. Jacob swindled Esau. Esau intended to kill him and harm him. Grandpa Isaac was a liar. He contracted a prostitute and slept with his son's wife. And great-grandpa Abraham was also a liar. Isaac and Ab his father Abraham had the same lie, telling people that their wife was not their wife, that it was their sister, and then putting them in a situation where somebody else was going to sleep with them they were cowards, trying to save their own skin, but at the expense of their spouse. This is the family of Joseph. And as he looks at his family, he's thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he had every reason to question the foundation of his family and to think on that, that nothing good can be built here. But it was time for a do-over. Things could be made right. Here's the thing. The story of Joseph was his brothers hated him so much that they grabbed him, were going to kill him. One brother said, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. So that's what they did. Sold him to some merchants that were traveling by who took him to Egypt and deposited him there. Resold him to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar's household prospered until his wife tried to sleep with Joseph, who wouldn't do it, and then they put him in jail. He, while in jail, I mean, his, he's going from bad to worse. It's one thing to be a slave. It's another thing to be in the dungeon. It's not like jail like we know jail, where you get a college education and, and buy things and have a life. No, it was real bad. So he went from bad to worse. His story is not good. But he was gone. He had left. He didn't choose to leave. He was forced to leave. But he left and was gone none the same. And God started promoting him and putting him, giving him greater freedoms, greater power, greater stature. God was doing something amazing in Joseph's life, even though his background of origin was a mess. But he was gone. He didn't have to face those people. Those brothers, those parents, the grandparents, he didn't have to deal with them anymore. Many of us jump on an airplane and depart. We jump into circumstances, careers, and we say, bye. We don't have to deal with you anymore. You're behind me. And we live our life and we ignore the situation, but things go unresolved. And many times there are things inside of us that have gone unresolved and they linger on and they affect our present he had later an opportunity because of a famine that brought his brothers seeking grain into the Egypt that he now had been put in charge of he was second in command only to Pharaoh himself the king of Egypt Joseph was the man God put him in that place God helped him to be there, but then God brought the circumstance where he would have to face his past once again and figure out what am I going to do with this. Every opportunity to bring punishment on his brothers and his family. He had the power. He had the opportunity. He could have done it, but
but he could not deny his past at that point. He had to face it right then and there. You know, we too can look at our family and do the same things. We can run from them. We can isolate. We can ignore. We can even punish by saying, oh, we're not showing up for that holiday or that wedding or this thing. No, we're, you can't see the grandchildren. We're not going to allow you. We can inflict our own punishments just the same. It's not easy being a part of a family, is it? Sometimes it's just a whole lot of heart, heartache and hard work. Thankfully, some of you have had a wonderful life growing up. But you go back a generation or three, and sometimes there's some stuff. And that stuff lingers and has its effect. Sometimes somebody thought, let's give everybody a DNA test for Christmas. And then when it's done, we find out we have brothers and sisters we didn't know about. Ooh, dad's got some splaining to do. It happens. But God wants you to acknowledge your past. Our foundations are planted in the sovereignty of God. We didn't get to choose our origin. We didn't get to choose our starting situation. We weren't a part of that. God himself made these decisions where we were to be born, in what culture, in which family, at what time period, in which birth order. All of this was his design. We had no part in this. But but God had a plan. And we look at our families and sometimes we go, what were you thinking, God? We can't change the things of the past. And that's what we have to reconcile with in ourselves. We can't make all that go away. We can't reorder it. It is what it was. But from this point, we're in the present and we have the ability to make some changes. If we don't, the past can unnecessarily affect our present and leave us in a situation where we're not actually present for our family, our friends, the people that are important around us. You can't drive a car forward looking into the rear view mirror constantly. If your eyes and attention are only on that rear view, you will crash. You will not anticipate. You will not see. You will not pay attention. Things will go wrong. Did God mean to place us in bad situations? Was that his plan? Is he that kind of God? No. God doesn't condone the sin that caused you pain. But if you'll submit your questions and your pain to him, he will lead you out. And with you, he'll lead others out as well. But God never wastes a hurt. He will use your scars to help others see the goodness of God. Oh, scars tell a story. Somebody asks you, well, how'd you get that one? I've got one that's running from here to here. It's starting to fade, but it's still there. As a little boy, I put my arm through a window. Oops. <laughs> it was something. <laughs> Sometimes our flesh heals a bit faster than our soul. Scars tell of healing, though. They're not an open, festering wound. They're scarred up, but they're, you know, it's healed. We're functional. We can move on. But our souls don't heal as fast sometimes. Sometimes it takes decades, maybe a lifetime, to sort out. But sometimes we have an encounter with God that can bring change and healing. The scars remain, but then it gives us an opportunity to have that conversation with somebody else who has an open wound, and we show them our scar, and we link up stories, and we testify about the goodness of God and how he can do the same in their life as he's done for us. And it becomes an amazing thing where God utilizes that stuff from the past and brings it full circle to something beautiful. 
Joseph had a choice to make with his past, with his family. God's plan wasn't to place you in difficult circumstances. His plan has always been to include you in his family. Let's look at Ephesians 1. Paul says this, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. No matter our past, God's got it covered. And our future, too. God wants you not only to acknowledge your past, he wants you to trust him for your future. Though God shared some dreams with Joseph, he did not, Joseph did not know how things would play out. There were these dreams that he gave Joseph where he told his brothers, but then there were dreams that he was utilizing to help him minister to some fellow inmates. And Joseph didn't know how this thing was going to play out. Neither do we. He didn't see the impact of what his commitment to Christ would make, his commitment to God, rather, would have. Though the circumstances seem to give Joseph just cause to despair. I mean, slavery, imprisonment, here comes a famine. He seemed to stay grounded somehow in his trust in God. As we look at the stories of Scripture and we look at Joseph, his story is a good one because we don't find fault in Joseph anywhere in here. He's a lot of... A lot of people in the Bible, we see they're good, the bad, the ugly, and it's a good mix. Him, it just seems to all be good. Somehow, through all these difficult circumstances, he remained focused on God. He remained able to see him, and it affected him in such a way as he didn't dwell on the past. He wasn't so future-oriented, but he was grounded in the present, and as such, he was able to to minister to fellow inmates, which then opened up the opportunity for him to be released. It was an amazing story. If you don't know it, I guarantee you need to read it. While some of us live in our past, some of us dwell in the future. Some are in the rearview mirror, and others are looking well beyond where their eyesight can take them in the front. But why do we do this? Why do our thoughts tend to be so focused sometimes so far down the road? A hyper-focus on the future can lead us to the sin of idolatry. The future goal becomes the idol. We start speaking with words like, when, then. When we get to then, everything will be better. When I get that, or when I attain this, when, and then, and it... It always becomes this cycle. And we notice sometimes, if we think about it, our, we are patterned sometimes. There's always that future thing. And whenever we attain that, it's like quickly on to dissatisfaction and looking for the next thing. And we promise our spouses, we promise our families, when this gets accomplished, when we attain this, then everything will be okay. Then everything will be better. Kylie Fuller some random person that I found on the internet. She says this. When we live for the future, we build grand expectations. We put years of happiness on a single moment, and in doing so, we set ourselves up for inevitable disappointment. What is the problem with living in the past or the future? Why do we dwell in the past? For many of us, it could be a focus on unresolved hurts or regret. Something bad happened to us, and we just can't get past it. We keep thinking of that. We keep dwelling on it. We keep thinking about the person who did that to us, or 
we remember what we did to somebody and we're living with regret and maybe they're gone and we can't fix it and we're just stuck. And that rehearses in our mind over and over and plays over and keeps us locked into this view of the rear view. Sometimes we're focused on the past because we're escaping the present. Maybe the present isn't good. And maybe we're looking at the good old days and reminiscing and talking about what was, and we're not focused on the here and now. Either way, we're not here and now. But why do we live for the future? Why do we have a focus that's so far down the road that we're not present either? And a lot of times that's discontent. Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. But some of us, we're never satisfied. It's like the Goldilocks story. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's never just right. And we're just not satisfied. And that discontent gets us looking at how to become content by attaining the next thing. We live in the future sometimes because of worry. We're terrified about what could be, so we're trying our level best to do everything in our power to make sure that doesn't happen, and we work ourselves into a tizzy, and we ignore our family because we're trying to ensure that we don't have the financial problems tomorrow that we had in the past, and so we're going to destroy the present for the sake of the what if. Why worry? Luke chapter 12, Jesus is talking. Jesus then said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? The effect of being future-focused is that we're not present. We may be physically present, but mentally and emotionally, we're not there. And sometimes your spouse nudges you and indicates you're not present. Pay attention. Sometimes the kids are begging for attention. I mean, if you look at the history of music, you can see song after song where there's this transition where the kids are interested and want dad's attention, and then later it flips and dad wants their attention and the kids are too busy. Imagine. And sometimes when we live in the future, we become negative about what is at present. Years ago, Kathy and I felt the direction of God to leave the military and to go to school in another state. I would go to Bible college. She would go to nursing school. But we had that plan long before we actually physically moved. And what happened over that period of time, from the time the plan was put in place to the time we actually moved, is we started to hate Biloxi, Mississippi. We started to hate our current circumstance. We let it just start eating at us because our focus was not here, today, present. It was somewhere else, and we made the view of what was to come so much more pristine than what was present and we began to compare and load the one. Can I tell you that puts you in a situation where you're living discontent? You're not happy. And you know what? Some of you are PCSing and you're thinking about what's coming and you can start to become irritated by everything here. And it's not productive. It doesn't help. It really makes you a mess. And then you're just gonna carry that same mess to the next destination. It's not good. <laughs> Wherever you are on your journey, your present is conditioned by how you embraced God up to this point. God wants you to embrace him in your present. There's a guy, an author, Henry Nguyen. He writes this. The real enemies of our life are the oughts and the ifs. 
They pull us backward in the, into the unalterable past and forward into the unpredictable future. But real life takes place in the here and the now. God is a God of the present. God is always in the moment. Be that moment hard or easy, joyful or painful. When Jesus spoke about God, he always spoke about God as being where and when you are. When you see me, you see God. When you hear me, you hear God. God is not someone who was or will be, but the one who is and who is for me in the present moment. That is why Jesus came to wipe away the burden of the past and the worries of the future. He wants us to discover God right where we are, here and now. God, the great I am, wants to help you. He will presently walk with you to deal with your past and your future. We first have to be right with God, though. We have to be right with God. We cannot be contrary to him, walking in a different direction and expect his help. We have to be aligned with him, walking in the same direction. To be right with God, we have to recognize our need for his help. We have to recognize our lack of ability to change some things. When we count on him and we put things in right order, then we have his assistance. But we first have to trust in his work on the cross and what he did for us, taking that and receiving that grace that he's so freely given. But having been reconciled to God, we are restored to our spiritual family, his family. And as for our natural family, as far as it is up to us, we must try to reconcile with the people of the past Forgiveness is Jesus' way, it seems to be. That's the clear, clear message of Scripture. Romans 12, Paul says this, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes the people that we need to reconcile with, they're not peaceful and they're not trying. But as far as it concerns you, do your best to try to reconcile. If you haven't made the attempt Now's the time. If we have present family problems, maybe not that family of the past, maybe present, or maybe it is our extended family, natural or spiritual family, if you've got problems, we now must seek to grant forgiveness. And we can seek forgiveness for the things that we've done. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For I... For if you forgive other people, this is Jesus speaking, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I find that highly troubling. That's a steep condition. Oh my, I want God's forgiveness. He tells a story of some servants. One had a debt that was just astronomical. He could not pay. The debt was forgiven. Then that servant found somebody who owed him money, a small amount, and he wouldn't forgive that person. When we don't forgive others, we forget the debt that we owed, that Jesus paid for. We have to get that fresh in our mind, and then it's easier to forgive others. When we stand and look at perfection, we recognize our own flaws, and then, then we can be forgiving of other people's. Misunderstanding, though, happens when it comes to forgiveness. How many times you walk through a hallway, somebody bumps you, and they're like, oh, sorry, <laughs> my bad. I hate that phrase, by the way. So I don't know when it came to be. Sometimes we pass things off. Forgiveness is not sorry. Because you can say that with just any angle of, of emotion or tone. Yeah, sorry. Forgiveness is quite another matter. 
It's the person that has been wrong that gives forgiveness. They don't even have to be asked. But what we struggle with is what has been done because it was wrong. Sometimes the sin that happened against us, the thing that was perpetrated on us was so wrong, there's no condoning it, there's no excusing it. Let's face it, sin is sin. It is not excusable. Everything bad that has happened to you at the hand of another person was wrong. But that doesn't keep you from forgiving. We do not condone sin through forgiveness. That's the thing that trips people up. If we say that it's wrong, we can at the same time say we forgive and both are right. It's meaning we're going to let this go. It was wrong. That cop who let you off, who gave you a warning... That's an example. You were clearly in the wrong, and you should have been punished, and he let you off just the same. I had a cop do that for me. I was going so fast. (laughs) He said if he reported it, they'd have to take my license, and I was like, oh. It's the blessing of COVID. You had open roads. You could just fly. (laughs) All right. Forgiveness frees the captive, and the captive is you. When you hold something against another, it's not them that suffers. It's not them that's living in the past. It's you. You're the one that's in prison, and you get to release yourself if you want. It's just like the gate's wide open. All you got to do is forgive and open the door. Walk out into freedom, into the present. It's on you. As you apply the principles of God's kingdom, his family values, then you will find freedom and peace to live in the present. If you find yourself stuck in the past, your spiritual family can help you. We can process and pray with you. We can spur you on, irritate you, provoke you, and walk with you. If, you, if you're stuck in the future, your spiritual family's here. We're here now to, to redirect your gaze to the God of the present. If you're not right with God, his grace and forgiveness are not available tomorrow. It's today. As the worship team returns to the stage, let's pray. Maybe you recognize that you're not yet right with God and you want to be that way. Maybe you've never been right with God. Or maybe you have been, but something has changed and you want to get right again. Then pray this with me. Father, I recognize that you are a loving God and that you have provided a way for me to be in relationship with you. Forgive me of my sins. Help me in the ways that I've offended you and others. Forgive me. Release me from this regret. God, I forgive others that have harmed me. And Lord, I don't want to be in this prison of resentment anymore. I want to move past it. God, I pray, enter my life and help me to be a part of your family. Teach me your family values and help me to know you. If you've been living in the past and need to find your way back to the present, then pray this. God, I pray that you would help each one of us that has been looking in the past, fixated on it, affecting our present, affecting our perception and our sense of self-worth. I pray, God, that you'd bring deliverance from that. I pray, God, that you would show us how to heal and that we would apply that healing, the healing balm of Gilead that comes from Jesus to our lives. If you've been so future-focused, living in a life of discontent, and you want to deal with that, let's pray. Father, I pray for each and every one of us who's been so focused on the next thing and ignoring every good thing that's right here in front of us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Help us to be present and to see the people around us 
and to embrace these relationships and to be present with you so that we can hear your voice. God, I pray that our focus would be continually upon you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray this 